Seymour Cray, a very big figure whenever it comes to parallel processing, once said, if you need to plow a field, would you rather use two strong oxen or 1,024 chickens? I'm having a little trouble picturing that. Saying you want to talk about parallelism is a little bit like asking how I want to transport people from point A to point B. There are so many ways to do it and so many different ways of measuring efficiency. Come on, let's go ahead and talk about transportation. For example, you could ride a motorcycle. Now, if our performance measure is the amount of miles per gallon, the motorcycle is a pretty good choice, right? Gets about 50 miles to the gallon. One person on a motorcycle, get 50 miles per gallon. But what if we want two people and each one has their own motorcycle? Well, if each one has their own motorcycle, suddenly our per person miles per gallon, our person miles per gallon is 25, right? 25 miles to the gallon. Do a lot better if you drive a car. Now, if you've got a car, what you've got is, well, four seats, right? And if there are four people riding along in a car that gets 25 miles per to, gal to the gallon, what you've got is four times 25 or 100 person miles per gallon. That's a lot better than the motorcycle. But all four of those people are going to be going in the same direction, right? What you've got is I'm going to go, I don't know, whether it's out to dinner or on vacation, you are all together. You're all doing your own, you're, you're, you're not doing your own thing. You're all doing everything together. Whereas with the motorcycle, you've got the opportunity to split off, to peel off. What about buses? They can carry a lot of people. Hey, a bus gets about six miles to the gallon. Pretty terrible, right? But if you've got 60 passengers on that bus, suddenly you've got 360 person miles to the gallon. That's a lot, right? But how many buses have you seen that are filled? Every seat filled to capacity. And plus, now you really have a real, everybody going on the bus from point A to point B, everybody's gotta have exactly, exactly the same destination in mind. And there's overhead, right? The overhead of having to pack the bus, getting to the bus station beforehand, and, and the tra transportation time from your home to the bus station and from the bus station to whatever your actual final destination is. It's unlikely all 60 people are going to meet Aunt Sally, right? Let's skip over one of the most efficient ways of travel, train, but go to airplanes. Let's talk about airplanes. If you've got an airplane that gets about 0.6 miles to the gallon, really terrible mileage, but you're carrying about 140 passengers, you're back up to a good range, 85 person miles to the gallon. But now we've got this thing about real overhead, getting to the airport really early before the plane takes off, checking in, going through security, uh, arranging for transportation to the airport and from the airport. But even more importantly, think about this. If you're going from, say, Charlotte, North Carolina up to Washington, D.C., on, on a particular carrier, you may have to go through Atlanta first. So a, a distance of 250 miles is actually going to take you 750 miles because of just the way the, the, the routes are laid out. Now, that may have seemed like quite a, a diversion from parallel processing, but let's get a better idea of parallel processing by categorizing them and seeing how different types of, of, of parallelism can result in different concerns for the programmer and for the user. Now, there's a great way of classifying parallelism, and it's called Flynn's Taxonomy. Now, Flynn's Taxonomy said, really, based on two characteristics, the instructions and the data, we can classify a parallelized system. Now, the way we look at this is I can have a single instruction or multiple instructions operating on a single data stream or on multiple data streams. All right. Now, these each one have a name and I'll, I'll, I'll just draw a little matrix up here. Now, if I've got a single instruction operating on a single piece of data, that's called single instruction, single data stream. This is basically a single core CPU. 
It's the machine that you program with. It's the machine that you're used to programming, where you've got this sequential order of operations that operates on some data in a single core. Now, if we want to improve efficiency, we need to move into one of these areas. This is basically the motorcyclist, right? One motorcyclist on a single bike. What about talking about the, the, the airplane or the car where we've got a bunch of them moving together. Well, we can do this, we can move a bunch of people together with multiple instructions operating on a single data stream. Multiple instructions, single data stream. Or we could have a single data stream, or excuse me, a single instruction operating on multiple data streams. Or we can have multiple instructions on multiple data streams. Wow, well, this one seems a little odd. We'll get to that one in a minute. But let's talk about these guys first. Single instruction, multiple data stream. Well, the primary application of this is something called vector processing. To picture this, let's use an example of a picture. Let's assume that I have a picture that each pixel is stored as RGB, as a value of red, a value of green, and a value of blue, combined together to make a 24-bit color. And I want to convert that to something we call grayscale. Grayscale being different levels of gray, right? How would I do this conversion? Well, one of the easiest ways is to, is to simply say what's one third of the amount of R plus the amount of G plus the amount of blue. You add the three colors together, you take the average, right? Now, in order to do this, I have to go pixel number one, add the red, add the green, add the blue, one third, store it as our new pixel one. Pixel two, add the amount of red, add the amount of green, add the amount of blue, take a third, and so forth. Store that as pixel two. Well, what I could do instead is have three vectors. Not really giving myself a lot of room here, am I? And the vectors are divided up so that the amount of red for the first pixel is in the first position of the first vector, the amount of green is in the first position of the, of the second vector, and the amount of blue is in the first position of the third vector where so this is pixel one all right now pixel two also has red green blue pixel three also has red green blue pixel four has red green blue and you get the idea right so we have in this case six of our pixels represented or loaded into three vectors now in order to do a single instruction, excuse me, a single instruction on multiple data, we have our multiple data there. What you say is add vector, or excuse me, yeah, add vector one to vector two to vector three, add all three of those together to come up with a fourth vector that has the sum of each one of those colors, then divide every single element all by a third. So I've got one instruction, add all three together. Two instructions, take a third of the result. All right. Now, what that allowed us to do is to do six operations with one instruction, six operation or, or six operations on six different parts of data, elements of data in with one instruction. That is what we call vector computing. Now, one of the problems you might see with something like this is that if red is a byte, green is a byte, and, and blue is a byte, and each one of these vector positions is one byte, then you're going to have more than likely an overflow. Whenever you try and put the result in a single byte, if you add three bytes together that's bigger than 255, you're gonna get an overflow. So the instruction may actually work better if I took first, to took a third of every element in red, then took a third of every element in green, and then took a third in every element in blue, then added them all together. You avoid the, you avoid the overflow chance, but you're still doing vector arithmetic. Simply say, take a third of this, take a third of this, take a third of this, all at one time, then add them all together. The result is the six pixel values for our grayscale, all right? Now, if I wanted to do this, well, over a large picture, I'd still have to do a lot of churning together. 
Since there's no real relationship between the values for the individual pixels with their neighboring pixels, what if I took a chunk of pixels, a group of pixels, added them together using this process, and then took another chunk, gave it to another processor to do exactly the same thing, and then took another chunk and gave it to another processor in order to do the same thing. Well, in that case, what you've got going is individual processors operating at different, you know, the, the instructions are not necessarily happening in lock sync. Each processor is working on its own program, its own instruction stream on a different, its own chunk of data. That would be something called multiple instruction, multiple data. And you're looking at something like a multi-core processor here. All right, so if you've bought a four core processor, for example, the Raspberry Pi has four cores, what you could do is easily say, okay, I've got this file that's stored on my file system. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, okay, core number one, you take the top left corner, core two, you take the top right corner, core three, you take the bottom left corner, core four, you take the bottom right corner. And then store the new picture, and then something will have to bring all that back together. That would be something that a multi-core processor would do. This is considered multiple instruction, multiple data streams. And the reason it is, is because the individual, the, the individual cores themselves, the, the instruction streams, while it's the same program that they're executing, it's not synchronized. One processor may be at a different point in the program than the other. They're independent instruction streams. Now it is possible that those four processors are not working on the same piece of data. Maybe Maybe those four processors are actually operating on different applications. One processor is actually doing image processing. One is doing audio processing. One is doing the operating system. So each one of the processors is doing a very different thing. That is possible. But if we spread that out so that, for example, I've got a large scale system, maybe a corporate system, where each one is doing a very different process, but maybe on the same data, uh, the data, same database, or maybe what they're doing is, is, is receiving customer requests, processing those customer requests based on a common uh, database, and then sending out the results. That would be something like a cluster, which is also considered multiple instruction, multiple data stream. All right. Now, in this case, what you might have is something like, oh, I don't know, um, maybe, uh, maybe, each, maybe each one of the cluster elements is supposed to be working on a different frame of a movie where they're doing the processing. Could be doing exactly the same operation, but they're doing it uh, independently and on different data blocks. Let's come back up here to this multiple instruction single data stream. Basically, this is theoretical. Now, the problem is that, well, I've seen some people say that a pipelined processor where you've got a single data stream and you've got a single uh, instruction stream, but those instructions are being, they're overlapping, their execution is overlapping. I've heard some people say that that could be considered multiple instructions, single data stream. Well, I don't know if I buy that quite right. It'd be more like if I've got, well, this, this, this converting from RGB to grayscale, that may not in fact be um, the best way to do the conversion. A lot of the time, we may wanna do this as a weighted conversion. The human eye sees green best. It then sees a level of red next, and blue it doesn't see as well as it sees green and red. So sometimes whenever you do a conversion from RGB to grayscale, you'll do something like 0.299 times the red, plus, I don't know, how about a 587, that's supposed to be a 587 times the green, plus, the 0 0.114 times the blue. Now, 
Maybe I want to have both of these done at exactly the same time so that I can present them to a user so the user can see the weighted and the regular averaged version of this conversion. I don't know. I'm just making this stuff up as I go along. In that case, what you might want to do is take the same data, the red, green, blue, and then have one set of vectors doing this calculation and one set of vectors doing this calculation. A single instruction comes in, both vectors are told to do exactly the same thing at exactly the same time, but with different weights. In that case, you might consider that as a, as a single instruction multiple data stream. But once you separate that, once you do that on two different cores, understand my example here meant that one core was sending one instruction to two different vectors, it's just changing the weighting, then you might consider that something like multiple instruction single data stream. But as soon as you separate that to two cores, you're back over here to multiple instruction multiple data stream. All right, that's just a brief introduction, give you an idea of the complexity of this parallelism problem and how we're going to use it when it comes to improving the performance of our applications.